All right, this is lesson number nine. In the book of Ephesians, I would ask you to open your Bibles if you have them. Chapter four, uh, verse one, Paul in one verse, he does this very well, in one verse he summarizes the three chapters, the three preceding chapters of this letter. And so he summarizes what he's said in three chapters and also uses this first verse in chapter four as a turning point in order to establish the context of the balance of the letter. So let's read uh, chapter four, verse one. He says, I therefore the prisoner of the Lord entreat you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you have been called. So in this verse, he reaches back to summarize everything he has already said. He's prayed that God enable the Ephesians to experience and grow in appreciation of the blessings that they have in Christ. He reminds them of God's great love in saving them, especially the Gentiles, when they were completely separated from God. And he also explains that God himself called them and now uses them to reveal his plan both to angels and to men. So Paul's going to continue in the chapter by saying that since these things are true, what things? Well, that all the blessings of heaven have been given to them, that both Jews and Gentiles were saved by the mercy of God, that God is now using them to reveal the truth to others. Since all these things are true and all these things have been done on their behalf, therefore they should live in such a way that these truths become evident to other people through them. So the obligations of this new life, this life as the church of Christ, are then explained in the balance of this letter. Because all of this is true, how ought you to be? That's kind of the fulcrum, that's, that's how he shifts from one to the other here in chapter four, verse one. So last week, we looked at the first of these obligations. How should you live because all these things are true? Last week we looked at the first obligation which was to maintain the unity that Christ has established. If all this is true, how ought you to be? You ought to, you ought to work at maintaining unity. Christ established this unity by creating and drawing to Himself the church, which would become united to God through Him. I mean, we say the words, you know, we say those words, but it's hard to get your mind completely around that idea. Christ enabled the church to maintain this unity by providing apostles and prophets and evangelists and pastors and teachers. Why? To help the church mature in the knowledge of and the service to Christ and one another. So how ought you to live? You ought to maintain this unity that Christ created. The unity that's in the Godhead must also be the unity that's between brothers and sisters, between the church and Christ. You ought to work to maintain that and Paul says, and God gives to the church gifts to help the church do that very thing. And what are those gifts? Prophets, apostles, elders, teachers, evangelists. Now the basis of this unity was expressed in the seven elements that every individual member of the church shares with every other member of the church, regardless of culture or time. Remember last week we talked about the difference between unity and conformity. Conformity is everything's the same. All the widgets are, are created, all the ball bearings you know, in a certain machine are exactly the same size, same weight, same resistance. You know, that's important in engineering. But in the church, unity uh, does not mean conformity. It means we equally share the same things. And so Paul tells the church what it is that they share, upon which things are based the unity that we have. And so he says each member equally shares the same body. In other words, everybody 
equally shares the body of Christ. There's no preferred place in the body. The hand is not more important than the eye and the, the foot is not more important than the arm. Every, everyone shares the body equally. They all share the same spirit. Everyone receives exactly the same spirit when they come into Christ. They all share the same hope. Everyone looks forward to the same heaven in the body of Christ. They share the same Lord. All are subject to Jesus only. You go to any church, you go to any you know, church of Christ anywhere in the world, and when they pray, they're praying in the name of Jesus. And that word Jesus may be different in different languages, but it's the same Lord. They share the same faith. In other words, they teach the same things. The teachings of the apostle, they continue steadfastly in the teachings of the apostles. Acts chapter two, verse 42. They share the same baptism. Each experience the same immersion in water for the same reasons. And they share the same father. All call on the God of creation, the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, the God who sent Jesus. That's the God that we share. And so he has said, and we talked about this last week, the pursuit of these elements of unity is the first obligation of the church because this is what keeps, this is what keeps it part of Christ that we share the same Lord, that we share the same faith, that we share the same baptism, that we share the same hope, that we share, the, that we share these things and we share them equally. This is the, the working out of our unity in Christ. We have church at different times, different kind of buildings. You know, some put the songs before the communion, some after the communion. You know, those, those are not the basis of unity. All right. So that's the first, if, if God has done this for you, then the first obligation is to maintain this unity. The second obligation that Paul speaks of is the need to be righteous and holy. The church is holy because God is holy. The church is righteous because God is righteous. To be righteous and holy means that you conduct yourself in a particular way you react to things in a particular way. Parents can relate to this. How many of you as parents have said to your children at one time or another, well that doesn't fly in this house. That's not the way we do it here. How many of you as parents have either said or as children, if you can remember back, your parents saying to you, you're not over at your friend's house. You're in this house now, and that's not the way we talk here. We don't talk to you, you, know, you don't talk to your mother like that, or you don't answer, that's not the way we do things here. So it's kind of that same spirit. If these things are true, then there's a way that you act. There's a way that you live in this body. And so we pick it up now in verse 17 of chapter four. He says, this I say therefore and affirm together with the Lord, that you walk no longer just as the Gentiles also walk in the futility of their mind, being darkened in their understanding, excluded from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the hardness of their heart, and they having become callous, have given themselves over to sensuality for the practice of every kind of impurity with greediness. So Paul begins explaining this idea with a comparison. He says that Christians do not act like non-Christians. And, and sometimes that's a problem. You know, we have someone in our family or someone that's close to us who is a non-Christian and we're disappointed when they don't act like Christians. A lot of times when I have a study with a couple or something like that and uh, maybe the husband or the wife or that person is a member of the church and their partner is not a member of the church and they're so disappointed that the person doesn't want to come to church or that the person is not zealous you know, for, to walk righteously. And I said, well, <laughs> they're not Christians. Christ is not the focus of their life. They might be nice people, they might do good things, maybe a good spouse, so on and so forth, but they're not motivated by the Spirit. 
Why expect them to live and act like Christians when, they, when they're not? So Paul is talking about a comparison between Christians and non-Christians and he's saying to the Christians at Ephesus, now that God has done all these things, because these things are true, you should walk in a righteous manner. And let me tell you what that righteous manner is and he does it in negative terms. The non-Christian, the pagans, they walk or they live according to what is in their minds or to what they've learned. The problem is that what is in their minds is vain and will not lead them to salvation, no matter how long they live. Because they lack the knowledge of the truth, their walk is characterized by several things. And Paul names these, misunderstanding. I'm not talking about misunderstanding of scientific laws, you know, the misunderstanding of the law of gravity or something. No, misunderstanding of spiritual laws, how things work in the spirit. Godlessness, ignorance, hard hearts, He's talking about people who really don't care about what is good. He says they are sensual in nature, sexually impure, and the never ending appetite for more. That's what greed is. Greed is not having a lot. I know a lot of people who are righteous Christians and they have a lot, they're wealthy. Greed is there's never enough. I mean, I've met poor people who are greedy because no matter what they have, it's never enough. And in this case, he's talking about greedy for more evil, more things. This is, he says, the substance of their lives. And he tells the Ephesians, this isn't your life. Because of all the things that God has done, surely this is not your life. And so he goes on in verse 20. He says, but you did not learn Christ in this way. If indeed you have heard Him and have been taught in Him, just as truth is in Jesus, that in reference to your former manner of life, you lay aside the old self which is being corrupted in accordance with the lusts of deceit, and that you be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and put on the new self which in the likeness of God has been created in righteousness and holiness and the truth. So the comparison is to the Christian's mind now. He says, don't do, don't, don't do like this, this is what the pagans do. Do like this, this is what Christians do. The one who is a member of Christ's church has his mind full of the word of God. Because he or she thinks this way, having been taught by the one faith, by the way, he has escaped the consequences of the Gentile walk, which is corruption which is death. You know, he says, hey, you have been saved. You were, you were almost dead and you were, you were plucked out of the fire and put into the kingdom of God. Now because he thinks this way, having been taught by the one faith, as I said, he has escaped the consequences of death. His walk, because of this knowledge, is holy and just and true. Remember, it's not about what you know, it's about how you apply what you know. So because he has been transformed by the one Lord, the one Spirit, the one hope, his manner of walking has also been transformed. It's not complicated. So the image is of one removing an old beggar's coat that identifies you as such and putting on a prince's cloak that completely transform how you feel about yourself and how others see you and feel about you. I guess a comparison to this is these, uh, these shows, you know, these makeover programs, you know, The Biggest Loser, and these to have all kinds of uh, shows where they transform someone. Of course, they use a personal coach, a personal cook, you take a year off from work, you work out six times a week. <laughs> but nevertheless, some people have some amazing transformations, right? They lose a lot, a lot of weight, and then of course they have a Someone comes in and redoes their hair, their makeup, you know, they get rid of their t-shirts and they put on a nice shirt and so on and so forth. And then the, the, you know, the money shot is at the end when, when they say, and now you know, they show a picture of the before and then say, and, and here's wherever Clarissa or Joe, you know, and, and Joe comes out and everybody goes, wow, whoa. And Joe has a new attitude. And yet yeah, it's the same old Joe in here, isn't it? 
But because there's been a change on the outside, you see Joe is talking with a lot more confidence. He's not afraid anymore to walk up to a girl and ask her for a date. That's usually the, the whole idea behind it. Of course, I once saw a program that followed the, the, these people, these contestants, two years later. And the sad thing is, many of them have kind of gone back to their old ways. Why? <coughs> because it's the same Joe on the inside. So Paul, what he's saying here, the thing that you put on, Christ, that completely transformed not just the outside, it transforms the inside. So Paul says that the church is obliged not to live as the pagans live, but rather live like Christ would live. And this new righteous or holy lifestyle has several recognizable features. So now in verses 25 and forward, he talks about the features of this righteous life. What does it look like? Well, first of all, he says, these people, these people who are walking in a righteous lifestyle have a proper attitude towards other people. In this section, he gives a list, not a complete list, but a list of attitudes that immediately identify a person who is of the household of faith, someone who lives righteously. So let's go to chapter four, verse 25. And he says, therefore, laying aside falsehood, Speak truth, each one of you, with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. So the proper attitude towards others, one, you know, this is a sub idea here. What is one of those proper attitudes? Sincerity. Be honest with everyone about everything, because dishonesty breaks ties, it destroys unity. In a marriage, in a friendship, especially in the church. What is another feature of this new attitude towards others? Verse 26 and 27, he says, be angry and yet do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and do not give the devil an opportunity. So another feature is peacefulness. Peacefulness, it's impossible to avoid anger. You can't avoid anger, it's a human emotion. It's actually dangerous to swallow down anger all the time. You'll get an ulcer, you'll have a heart attack. And some people are more prone to anger than others. Some people, their character, just the way they're put together, it's easy for them to be angry. It's how they react to things. You know, some people, something bad happens or whatever, their reaction is they pull away or they turn away or they, kind of, they isolate themselves. Other people, when things go wrong, what do they do? They blow up, they puff up in anger. And so it's impossible to avoid anger, but a child of God always works towards peace as a first priority. And this idea, don't let the sun go down on your anger, this doesn't mean you have to have closure within 24 hours. I used to think that, and you keep my wife up till four o'clock in the morning, talking, talking, talking. She'd say, can't we just talk about it tomorrow? <laughs> doesn't mean you have to get closure before the end of the day, it's an expression that means do not let anger go beyond its time. You know Solomon says there's a time for everything, there's even a time for anger. And Paul is saying but don't let anger go beyond its time. It's normal, it's natural for people to get angry and upset at stuff that happens, but let anger only have its time. Some people live in anger. I mean, they're, they're just, you know, they use anger as a, as a club to beat other people with. They, they use anger to get their way, you know, and so on and so forth. He's saying it's normal to be angry. It happens to everybody. But let's, let's allow anger just to have its time. And your goal is to do what? To work towards peace. In the midst of your anger, you're asking yourself, what should I be doing as a Christian? The answer, Paul says, you should be working towards peace. What must I do to work towards peace, to work myself out of this anger? In verse 28, same idea. He says, let him who steals, steal no longer, but rather let him labor, performing with his own hands what is good, in order that he may have something to share with him who has need. So another feature of this new lifestyle, if you wish, is responsibility. Proper attitude towards others 
that demonstrate righteousness, you are a responsible person. Be a giver, not a taker. Saints work to give, not to hoard. Verse 29, again, we could spend a lot of time on each, but verse 29 says, let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth, but only such a word as is good for edification according to the need of the moment, that it may give grace to those who hear. Gracious speech. What Christians say is said to build the body, not tear it down. If what comes out tears down, don't say it. Just don't say it. Someone says, oh, but you know, I have such a hard time. You know, I have a critical nature. How do I deal with that? Just stop talking. <laughs> if that's the only thing that comes out of your mouth is criticism, then just don't talk. Don't say anything. You know the old adage that your mother told you, if you can't say something nice, don't say anything at all. That was a wise adage that my mother said to me quite often. In verse 30 it says, and do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you along with all malice. And be kind to one another, tender hearted, forgiving each other, just as God in Christ has also forgiven you. So your responsible, uh, gracious speech, another feature of, of the Christian walk and how you know, we deal with other people and then mercy how we deal with other people in a merciful way. The Holy Spirit is given to us to help us grow and to encourage and serve others to grow in unity and love. When the church is involved in bitterness and anger, exasperation, strife and harsh speech against others, it frustrates the work of the Spirit because the Spirit is there to help the church grow in Christ. Disagreements and offenses are bound to rise up, but the proper response in the spirit for the church is mercy and forgiveness and kindness, always remembering that this is the way God treated the church. When I'm uh, being critical of someone or something, I have to bring myself back and say, Okay, how did God treat me now? Let me, let me think back of what I used to do. You know, how, how has God treated me? Or how would I like to be treated in this situation? What, what would I want? Well, you know what? 100 times out of 100, I would want mercy. <laughs> I would want understanding. I would want someone to see the dumb, selfish, immature thing that I've done and give me a break and give me a second chance. So God is simply saying through Paul, that's how you ought to treat others. Nothing new, there's nothing new here, that we're, there's no big revelation as Christians. And so the first recognizable feature of righteousness is the way that members treat each other in the church. You know, John 13, 35, this is how all men will know that you are my disciples in the way that you love one another. All right, another feature of righteous living. So one feature of righteous living is how we treat each other. And I've given you some of the you know, peacefulness, gentleness, mercy. You know. Okay, another feature of righteous living. He begins in chapter five. Another feature of righteous living is a higher quality of life. In the previous paragraph, Paul focuses on relationships and how a righteous people treat one another. Again, it's not an exhaustive list. It's just, for example, this is how we ought to treat each other. In chapter five, he will target the Christian's personal conduct and how this conduct must rise above the believer's conduct if it is to be seen as righteous. Now remember, to be seen as righteous by whom? Uh, by other people. We're seen as righteous by God because of Christ. God is not looking at you know, how we've managed to uh, you know, achieve honesty or hospitality or kindness. You know, he's, not, he's not measuring those levels and say, well, I don't know if the level is high enough for this guy to come to heaven. When God looks at us, he sees Christ. That's the whole point of the death of Christ, the whole point of the shedding of His blood, the whole imagery of baptism, dying to self, resurrecting to a new life. When God sees us, He sees us through mercy. 
This righteous life is not to impress God because He knows exactly what we're like. This righteous life is lived to give a witness to other people that they might be drawn to Christ. And so he's going to target the Christian's personal conduct, as I say, and how this conduct needs to rise above. So let's start, chapter five, verses one and two. He says, therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love just as Christ also loved you and gave Himself up for us an offering and a sacrifice to God as a fragrant aroma. So he summarizes the previous section by comparing everything down to one word or compressing everything down to one word, love. If you've been in my classes before on, on Paul's epistles, you realize that he, this is you know, a, something that he does, a device that he uses. He explains something in detail, like he telegraphs it ahead of time saying this is what I'm going to talk about. He gives all the details and then he switches gears, he compresses everything down to one word and then he uses that word as a bridge to get to his next idea and that's exactly what he's done now. He says, if you love by treating others with mercy and gracious speech and so on and so forth, then you're walking like Christ. And if Christ's life was like a pleasing sacrifice to God, then your imitation of Him is your own, uh, in your own life will also be a similar sweet offering to God. Now in the following verses, he'll show how very different a Christian and a church member's conduct is from unbelievers. He likens the difference between the two as the difference between light and dark. So chapter five, beginning in verse three. He says, but do not let immorality or any impurity or greed even be named among you as is proper among the saints. There should not even be a suggestion that things are improper, are happening among you, whether it be for fornication or impurity or greed. Avoid even things that appear or may be interpreted as being unworthy of someone who is a saint. This is the hardest thing to teach young people. It's the hardest thing to teach young people. It's a subtle idea. When my children were growing up, you know, they were to go to a certain concert or do certain things. You know, I'd say, you know, I don't think that's a good idea. You know, Why? Everybody else is going. You know, I said, well, because you know, that's not something that, that gives a good witness of who you are. Oh, dad, you know, blah, blah, blah. very hard. And it's very hard for many Christians to understand have this uh, discussion all the time about gambling, going to the casino. Uh oh, I'm in trouble now. Uh, and people say, oh, nothing to it, we go to the casino. I say, yeah, sure, it's, what a witness, way to go. I'm sure everybody who's there who knows that you're a Christian are really impressed with your righteousness. Terrific, go ahead. Oh, but I only take 10 bucks, I only put 10 bucks in, you know, I only spend $20. Yeah, sure, wonderful, $20, yeah. It's a hard concept to understand. We many times do not want to give up our small little pleasures, and that's what it is, a small little pleasure, in the service of righteousness. Very hard concept to understand. I'm not picking on you guys who go to the casino, I'm just saying. Well, maybe I am picking on you guys who go to the casino. No one in this room is doing that, but if you know of anyone, please let them know about this, okay? So verse four, he continues, he says, and there must be no filthiness and silly talk or coarse jesting, which are not fitting, but rather giving of thanks. When saints are together, they must not act like the Gentiles, but rather act like the saints. That isn't hypocrisy. We're hypocrites if we act like the world, when in reality we are saints. That's hypocrisy. So he talks about three things. He talks about filthiness, well, indecency, things that are indecent. Don't talk about things that are indecent. And silly talk, empty talk, talk that's devoid of truth. Uh, in this case, what Paul is talking about here, probably superstition and things like that. And coarse jesting, dirty talk, nasty talk. These things, he says, has no place among those who call themselves holy. You know, I hear people sometimes, uh, workmen, you know, that, that would come into the building in the past when, you know, when we were doing construction, and some guy would curse, ah, you know, something go wrong and let out a curse word or something, and the other worker would say, hey, we're in the church building, or they'd curse in front of me. 
and say, hey, the preacher, you know, and I'd say, hey, that's not my language, that's your language. You don't have to apologize to me. You didn't take my name in vain. Paul is saying your language should be the same when you're in church or out of church, same thing. And then in verse five he continues and he says, for this you know with certainty that no immoral or impure person or covetous man who is an idolater has an inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. These things are not of saints but of Gentiles and you know that the Gentiles are damned. Why act like them? Verse six and seven, we need to move along. He says, let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore do not be partakers with them. Don't be talked into participation. It is for these very kind of sins that God will punish the Gentiles. So don't participate with them, or you will participate with them in the punishment as well. So we keep moving along, verse eight. Uh, verse eight, he says, for you were formerly in darkness, but now you are the light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. Remember who you are when pressured to participate with those who want to do the deeds of the flesh. You're of the light, not of the darkness. Make sure you are of the light. Verse nine, for the fruit of the light consists in all goodness and righteousness and truth. You are children of God. You do not produce darkness, you produce light. The thing that comes from you is light. The thing that comes from, emanates from you is goodness and truth and righteousness and, and proper living. That's what comes forth from you. If, if, if the guys don't want to invite you to the casino because you oh, don't even ask him, he's going to say no, I don't participate, We're going, he's going to make us feel guilty. If that's how they talk about you, good for you. If you're at the shop and, and, and somebody goes, rah, rah, oh, oh, sorry man, sorry. If that's the way they treat you, they, want to, they don't want to talk dirty in front of you, good for you. It means the light is emanating from you and the darkness doesn't want to come even close to the light, good for you. you you've made a witness without saying a single word. Verse 10, he goes on, chapter five, verse 10, trying to learn what is pleasing to the Lord. On the contrary, try to find out how to please the Lord, not how to grieve the Spirit. Try to find out what more you can do, not how you can cut corners in Christ. You know, what's the limit? You know, where's the line for sin? I, I just, so many people, you know, they want to just get up to the line for sin and stop right there. Why do that? I would encourage you to stay as far back as you as you can. Verse 11 and 12, he says, and do not participate in the unfruitful deeds of darkness, but instead even expose them, for it is disgraceful even to speak of the things which are done by them in secret. Be aggressive, don't participate, expose them, rebuke their sin. Some, some things are too shameful to mention, why discuss it? Verse 13, but all things become visible when they are exposed by the light, for everything that becomes visible is light. You're the light, then don't hide the light of truth. Use it to bring everything into the light. You know, a lot of different ideas here, but one idea is that when you bring the deeds of darkness into the light, it is motivation for sinners to become children of light themselves. Because the first step, why do you think Peter said, repent and be baptized. Why did he say repent first? Because unless you understand that you're a sinner, that you break God's laws, you don't want to be baptized. You don't want the new life. So as children of light, we're, we're, we're shedding light on the dark deeds of others. It's okay. It's not being hypocritical or judgmental. It's the way that they will see the wrongness in their lives and hopefully seek for the truth. Verse 14, he says, for this reason it says, awake sleeper and arise from the dead and Christ will shine on you. Um, this, this little passage here may be an early Christian poem or song expressing the power of light of Christ on the sinner and the um, uh, a mentioning of this uh, what Paul, and, and the summarizing uh, what Paul has said 
in this section. So you know how a preacher finishes with a poem sometimes? He's finishing this section here with a poem to summarize. So righteousness is also evident from personal conduct that is in direct contrast to the world, that's one form, and also a witness to its sinfulness. So the saved are special and they walk differently. They walk in unity. They walk in holiness or righteousness. The righteous uh, or the righteousness rather that Paul says is noticeable in that first of all it is a complete transformation from the old way of life. And this righteousness, remember the summary now, God has given you all these things, He saved you, He's shown mercy, so on and so forth, therefore because He's done that then there's a response that comes from you. And what we've read here is the details of the response and basically is you're responsible to live a righteous life. And this righteous life has certain features. Number one, it's filled with kindness and compassion and forgiveness and love towards others. And then number two, it is total. Living in the light without even a suggestion of impurity in words and actions. How you treat each other and how you live your life before Christ. This type of living inevitably lights up all the darkness around it, thereby creating light where there was darkness. All right, so we're going to continue on with this idea. He, he brings out some more idea. You know, if God did this, this should be your response. So there are other responses he continues on.